Welcome to Of Mind and Men, The Evolution of Mindedness in the West. We're going to be talking today once again with Haythrun about part two of this series. This time we're going to be talking about the tripartite theory of the soul. Thank you for joining us, Haythrun. Thanks so much, Noah. It's a pleasure to be here. How have you, how have you been? I've been doing great. You know, the last episode in this series, the very first episode that we did, it's had a lot of impact on people. I had a lot of reports back of people listening to it and saying that it really helped them to understand what's happening right now in the news, uh, where their place in society is, to understand why they are responding differently perhaps than their neighbors or their family to various uh, news that's happening and to the stressful situations that people are going through. And I think it's very important for us to understand the history of our own people and how we were organized and how we think and how we have developed to function together so that we find a comfortable place in society where we belong and where we're able to contribute the most. And so this series, I'm really looking forward to the next parts of the series and continuing along that theme. It's been very useful. Well, I'm glad to hear that. That's great feedback. Uh, you know, particularly for those of us who are of Indo-European descent, I think learning about the trifunctional system is so important uh, for that very reason, because it's been with us uh, since at least the classical period, and it gives us all a, a very clear indication of where we need to be in society based on our gifts. And uh, yeah, so it's great feedback to hear from your audience. Um, we're going to recap the trifunctional system a little bit before we get into the tripartite theory of the soul today. And uh, this is going to kind of help folks to understand how that uh, relates to uh, Plato and Plato's theory. So if we could just jump to the first slide here, uh, there's a quote by Plato that I'd like to share with your audience. And it goes like this. There are three classes of men, lovers of wisdom, lovers of honor, and lovers of gain. Now, the lovers of wisdom, as your audience may, may, uh, may see here, those would correlate with the first function that we talked about in the last part. The lovers of honor, that would be the second function, and the lovers of gain would be the third function. And this is basically the mind, the spirit, and the body. You can see that there, that pyramid. And uh, there's basically three different types of offspring that each function produces. You know, a lot of people, when they think about offspring, they just think about children. But one's offspring or the output of one's production is really dependent upon what function they're in. So, yeah, the third function people, uh, they're going to be producing material offspring, both in the form of children and also material goods, what we might consider to be the, uh, the, the gross domestic product or the material wealth of a society. Uh, which makes up the largest volume of, of that wealth. But the, um, the other two functions, the, uh, the second function, they're going to be producing acts of valor. That, that's really what their offspring is. And the first function, they're going to be producing uh, art and ideation and products of intellect. So this is how these three work together. And I think uh, Plato's quote here really uh, surmises that well. And it's interesting, Plato's not saying there are three classes of men and this one's good and this one's not good. What it's saying is, is that we have a system of organization where people prefer to produce one thing or the other, uh, whether that's their psychology, their biology, uh, whether it's cultural, it doesn't matter as much as the fact that we work together. The three together make a culture, make it work. And we need the input of all of them. If we don't have the those who are producing gain, if we don't have people producing things to eat, we all starve. If there's no one there to produce valor, to defend us, to, um, to, to protect our civilization, then we're prey to other people. And if we have no one there who's producing beauty and art and wisdom and music and these type of things, uh, we end up becoming a, a very uh, bland and a dumb society and a society that's incapable of seeing into the future. I also like to, to note how the three classes have different levels of vision. The lovers of wisdom, they tend to have a very far sight. They see into the future and they're concerned with creating things that last for a long time. They're concerned with the long-term future of their civilization. They create the art and the statues and things like that and the architecture. The lovers of honor are concerned with 
the next battle, the next enemy that might appear. And so it's a little bit shorter. It's things with how will the next few years, how will we protect ourselves? And the lovers of gain, they tend to be basically season by season. I, I got to get the next crop in. And so they each are looking after different aspects of what is necessary to form a civilization. And that really is a big part of what made Western civilization great is that specialization. In an mm -hmm. extremely primitive civilization, you don't have specialization. You don't have enough people. When we were able to make this specialization, our culture grew up rapidly. And we see this really first in, in ancient Greece. We see that growing up. Yeah, yeah, that's a great observation. I, I've never heard anyone put it quite that way in terms of the three different uh, degrees of vision, so to speak. But um, yeah, that's absolutely true. So um, yeah, let's talk about um, the, the theme of this part. It's um, the tripartite theory of the soul, which is uh, one of Plato's theories. And um, I'm just going to the next slide here. So um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about Plato. Uh, Plato was an Athenian philosopher, as I'm sure everybody knows. He was uh, the student of Socrates and uh, the forerunner of Aristotle. Aristotle was, was his student. And um, Plato gave us a, a great work called The Republic, which we're also going to talk about in this, uh, in this particular part. But, um, you know, Plato was very much influenced by the death of his mentor, Socrates, and we see that reflected in The Republic. Uh, some argue, you know, whether or not he was a statist or simply observed uh, the statism uh, in that work. Um, but, uh, you know, he certainly, you know, saw how, how states come to power and the stratification of a state and um, how that's formed. And it ties in with his tripartite theory of the soul. So those are going to be the two big subjects we talk about today. Um, Plato was, was a huge man. Um, he was a wrestler, I believe. I, I think you've done some, some study of Plato yourself, Yeah, he yourself, was a wrestler. Right? They used to joke he had to go through doors sideways. I do yeah. remember reading that. Uh, he had broad shoulders. He was very physically fit. And you can see in the image of him, this is not a delicate man. This is a man of, of physical robustness. And I think that influences a person's view of the world. And that definitely influences Plato's philosophy. He was very practical. He understood that violence exists in the world. Uh, like all uh, ancient Athenian men, he served in the military during his youth. And so they understood that violence existed in the world. They understood that the state was organized violence. And his goal was to fight, figure out a way to organize that violence in the way that was best for humanity, for best for the civilization as a group and also for individuals. And it's not that Plato's ideas are perfect, it's that they do reflect reality. And reality is not perfect. Reality is what it is, it's, it's not a utopia. And so it's, for listening to what Plato has to say, um, so many years ago, and then seeing how that still plays into modern politics, gives you an idea of how accurate it was, how well he had come up with a model of how things work. Yeah, and, and the model that he came up with is what has served as the blueprint for, I think, every form of civilization in the West since the classical period. I mean, we can see it reflected in the tricolor flags of just about every country in Europe. Um, and, uh, you know, here in, in the United States, we see it too in, in our tricolor. Um, I mean, we don't have the three bars, but we have the red, white, and blue, you know, to, to symbolize the three functions and the three, uh, the three aspects of the soul that Plato gave us. And he also greatly influenced Christianity. Uh, I think a lot of people don't realize that, that um, there, there's a Neoplatonism in Christianity, or at least the, the, the Western European vision of that. So we really owe a lot to Plato and to Plato's observations and the models that he has given us. And so I think with it, the, it's oh, impossible to understand our, our history of our people without having a good understanding of Plato because of how influential it was on every part since his lifetime, how much influence he's had. Yes. So let's get into um, his theory of the soul. I, I have a, a slide here that breaks that out into a diagram of the human body and where these different aspects of the soul were located in the human body, according to Plato. 
So as you can see here, we've got um, these three aspects that sort of look like chakra centers and they correspond with chakra centers in the body. And uh, we'll start at the very top here with the logical or in Greek, what's called the logisticon. Now, this was regarded by Plato to be the seat of logos. And this was the thinking part of the soul. This was the part of the soul that loved truth and wanted to, to learn it and to, to become perfected by it, to become one with it. This was also regarded as being the smallest part of the soul. So it, it had the smallest influence compared to the other two. But um, one who was oriented towards this logical part of the soul was seen as someone who was in accordance with the good, in accordance with the true, in accordance with that which is harmonious or, or that which is um, part of nature's design, natural law. And um, Plato said that the Athenians as a people best exemplified this as being governed by this logical part of the soul. And you can see that in their culture. Uh, the, the Athenians gave us great art and music and architecture. And um, the, the, the younger gods, you know, Apollo and, and Athena, they exemplified all of this. The, the arts, wisdom, um, excellence in battle, uh, all of these qualities uh, would, would be part of this aspect of the soul. Almost everything we know about ancient Greece is from Athenian records. Uh, very yes. little came to us from the others, almost nothing from Sparta. Uh, nothing actually written came from Sparta. And it's, they, they not only uh, were the first to start really recording and doing this type of thinking, but they had a culture that was fairly open to new ideas. Um, um, fairly open, I mean, Her Aristotle was killed for new ideas, but uh, fairly open but, compared to... You mean Socrates. <laughs> oh, Socrates, sorry, yeah. Socrates. Um, although that was po mostly political in a way. Mm -hmm. But it is interesting that they had such a huge impact on us. Uh, they weren't the first large culture, but they were the first one to really do things in what we might call the Western way. And that's why they're so influential today. They was the pioneers yes. for what we do today. Okay, so you just you were talking about the Spartans there a moment ago, which ties right in with uh, the second part of the soul that we're going to talk about, which is the spirited or Thymeides. Uh, the spirited aspect of the soul corresponds with the chakra center that's nearest to the thymus gland. And Plato referred to this as being high spirit or righteous anger that which motivated one to act in the cause of good when it was oriented upwards towards the logisticon. Now, if it was oriented downwards towards the appetitive, which, which we're going to talk about here in a moment, then this would be more uh, like rage, just pure rage, something that's you know, con consuming as opposed to oriented towards a higher purpose. But um, this part of the soul was exemplified most uh, by the Spartans. Uh, Plato spoke to this as a very warrior culture. You know, you mentioned a moment ago that they didn't write anything down. And that's true because reading and writing, that wasn't something that interested them. These were men of action. These were men of spirit. These were men of war. And uh, all of their, their life and their culture centered around becoming these great warriors who were possessed of this high spirit. I mean, just take a look at the, the Battle of Marathon. That's a great example of what men who are moved by high spirit do. So, uh, and, the, and, and it's, it is interesting that the Greek people, when they were split apart, they're, they're representing, represented in various aspects of this, and eventually they all come together. And that brings together the aspects necessary to make a greater culture. Mm -hmm. And each one was able to develop their own on their own and then come together to bring it together. And it's, uh, it really is an interesting way that that evolved. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the third aspect of the soul, the appetitive, uh, which in Greek is the epithemitikon, that's a long word. <laughs> the appetitive is the largest part of the soul. And it's also the oldest part of the soul. And um, we'll, we'll talk about how that's so in the next section of this presentation. But the appetitive is 
what what uh, what calls us to to consume uh, for the purposes of survival, um, for the purposes of reproduction. But when it is not governed by the logical, when it is not governed by reason, it causes us to basically become addicts. Right? We we can consume anything to excess. We can consume too much food. We can consume too much sex. We can consume too much emotion. We can find ourselves just just being consumptive of everything. And unfortunately, this is what modern society has come to, to be. Uh, if you take a look at people in the West, uh, on the whole, in the majority, they are being governed by the appetitive. And Plato said that people who were appetitive were unjust. They were ruled by uh, carnal desires. They were ruled by their hunger, by their thirst, by their appetite for money. Um, this part of the soul is opposed to the logical. It is alogical. And as far as the ancient peoples were concerned, um, the Phoenicians and the Egyptians, according to Plato, best exemplified the appetitive. They were very much concerned with coin and gain and material, uh, material things. Uh, the Egyptians, you know, of course, built greater tombs to the dead uh, than they did to celebrate the living. So, these are the three aspects of the soul, according to, to Plato's theory. And he had an image that he gave us that I didn't include in this diagram, but I'm going to uh, just briefly describe it to your audience. And, and this was of the three aspects of the soul working together in concert. And it was of a chariot, charioteer who was driving two horses. And the one horse, the spirited part of the soul, was a white horse. And the appetitive part of the soul was a black horse. The charioteer was the logisticon or the logos. And the task of the logisticon was to bring those two horses under his control to a purpose so that, so that he could drive that chariot and, and control it and use it for good, use it for a higher purpose. When that charioteer is not in control, the horses run wild. And, and can be pulled in one direction or the other. So this is one model that, um, that I have here in this slide, and then the other model is the one I just described. And I, I like how that is a description of it. Um, there's a lot of people that will decide that I, I want to control myself. And so what they do is they stamp down their spirit and they stamp down their appetites and they try to become without appetite because they, the Buddhists talk about this, uh, not want anything, not be connected to anything. And the Greeks had a very different way of looking at that. Plato had a very different way. Uh, the spiritedness was good. The appetites were good. This was all positive when it was under control of the logical part of the brain. And I, I think this is a much healthier way for Europeans to think of things. Um, you know, uh, Buddhism is a, uh, an Asian ideology works great in their cultures but in our culture the wisdom that works good is to be people of high spirit people of healthy appetite but to have that under control and it's why we're able to do truly fantastic things oh yeah and you know some other things that we see here in this model here in the united states we have three branches of government uh our our founding fathers were really brilliant in the design of our government here. And you'll see the three branches of government in Plato's model. Uh, our judicial branch is the logical part of the branch. They, they are nine justices and they govern over the wisdom uh, of the country. That, that is their, their role to uh, interpret the constitution. To, that's basically our Bible here in the United States. And um, the spirited part would be the executive branch. You know, our president is the commander in chief of the armed forces. That that's his role, the protective role. And then the appetitive part, that's our Congress, our, our two houses of, of Congress that represent the producer class. They're the ones who make law. So you can see that exemplified right there and, and how those three branches work together. It's kind of like how the three parts of the soul work together. We also see here, I'd mentioned earlier that um, Plato influenced Christianity, and I know a lot of your, your listeners uh, are Christian. You can see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in this model. The, the Father, or uh, what is sometimes referred to as the divine masculine, 
that's the oldest part of the soul. Now, I, I know here, you know, it's appetitive, but it, it is the oldest part of the soul because it's the reptilian part of the brain corresponds with that. The spirited, that's sometimes referred to as the Holy Spirit or the divine feminine, the seat of conscience, right? That little angel inside of you that, that tells you right from wrong and, you know, tries to pull you upward as opposed to downward. And then the logical or the logos, Christ is oftentimes called the logos, this is the product of the divine masculine and the divine feminine. It is, it is a male divine child. It's male because it acts out in the world. What did Christ say? I'm the way, the, the way, the truth, and the life, right? So you can see that model in here too. Fantastic. Yeah, I think that it's amazing how deeply it has affected us uh, such that we see almost everything through this lens. Mm-hmm. And it corresponds with the brain too. Um, I don't. I don't. Have a, I don't think I have a diagram here of the brain, but I can briefly describe it. The appetitive, thats the reptilian part of the brain. It's concerned with motor function, uh, basically uh, survival and reproduction. Right? It's it just. It's illogical. It's just completely, uh, you know, psychopathic in terms of uh, its function. The, I told um, someone today it was eat, sleep live, have sex. Yeah, that's <laughs> it's just it. Like, it cycles you through those things repeatedly. Right. And if you've ever seen like a cutaway view of the brain, I mean, it's literally little more than the brain stem. That, that's yeah. all it is. And, uh, you know, all animals have this. That's why I say it's the oldest part of the soul. I think that's why it has the most influence because it's the oldest brain that all animals have, including us. And then layered on top of that, is the, the limbic part of the brain, the mammalian brain, and that's what gives us a capacity for empathy and compassion. You see that in mammals, uh, and of course, us being mammals, we have that too. That's kind of the maternal, you know, divine feminine uh, that I referred to. And then over top of that is this huge neocortex. That's the human part of the brain, and that's what gives us the ability to, lo to have logic and reason and, and insight and intuition and creativity and... Uh, higher order thinking, critical problem solving, all of those things. So you can see that there too. Fantastic. Uh, it's, they, they intuited what we now with science have proven to be facts, mm -hmm. that, there are, that the brain is, is split up into these groups. And it, it is interesting, there have been people that have been born without a neocortex and they still function. Not, not at a super high level of IQ, of course, but they are still functional. They don't, they don't have the whole brain. There's been people who have um, had cancer that ate everything but the brain stem, and they were still able to more or less function, get up, walk around. They couldn't remember anything, and they, they were emotionally dead, um, but they were able to function. And it, it, it proves that these are separate parts of the brain rather than just appearing to be separate. Uh, you know, I, I, I find that a lot of people who are depressed are too high, always in their neocortex, are always in their logical side, but they're lacking in the spirit and they're lacking in listening to their appetite of appetitive part, which is telling them to sort to live, 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 and to have empathy for themselves. And so they end up um, in, in the depression. Uh, you know, it's, it is interesting how these pieces need to work together. You know, they need to work under the, direction of the logical part of the brain but when any part of this becomes ignored it has a negative effect on us and i think a lot of it is balancing that out um, bal balancing between uh, where we're putting our effort and our energy and there are times when you just want to listen to your appetitive um, you know you you I, I said this with some clients today you go into your bedroom with your wife. You just need to listen to the appetite. Forget the logical. Don't analyze the situation. Enjoy <laughs> yourself. You're eating a big steak meal with some lovely potatoes and having a glass of wine with friends. Uh, you know, listen to your appetite and your spirited and enjoy that with your friends. Don't analyze everything everybody says. Relax and enjoy yourself. Um, then there are other times when we're making long-term decisions about our life and we need to focus on what our neocortex or our logical part of our brain is telling us and so there are there is a time to listen more to one part or the other 
And there's a time to, uh, of course, have that all under control by the logical part in the end. But we get a lot, we have a very complex brain as humans. And I think we get very little training on how to use it. Yeah. Uh, mostly we get training on in obedience and very little in thinking. Yeah. yeah. And there's also a time to take action. There's a mm -hmm. time to listen to that spirited part and, and to have courage, you know, because that's really where courage comes from. This is the seat of it um, at the solar plexus or at the heart chakra. And yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people, I think, especially today with all that's going on in the world, really need to listen to that. They know right from wrong. They know that what they might be choosing to do is morally wrong, but they haven't mustered up the courage to take the right action. Mm -hmm. And we need more people to do that, both men and women. If you know the right thing to do, you got to choose to do the right thing, right? You've got to let that be pulled upward towards just action. So important. Yes, and I, I, you know, I've said this many times to other men, don't trust a man who can't get angry. Yeah, there's, there's something wrong with a man who's incapable of feeling anger because it, there is just anger and just anger is an essential part of masculinity, that ability to see injustices and become angry and not to lose control and rage, but to channel that anger into something productive, whether it be creating something to overcome that injustice or actually fighting the cause of the injustice. And men are going to have to remember that soon because we're coming to a time where we're going to be tested as men and we're going to be asked to get in contact with our just anger once again. Yeah, well, we're, we're facing that here in America right now. The men of this country are then going to be required to act and ultimately that responsibility does rest with the people and ultimately with the men to restore the republic. So interesting times to be living in for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think we're going to really see how, what kind of a precarious situation we're in as we move on to the next slide where we talk about yeah. the Republic's five regimes. Oh, there it is. Yeah, there it is. Let's talk about this. This is a big one. So um, one of Plato's works, it's a huge work uh, called The Republic. It's several volumes. Uh, if anybody wants to read it, that's an undertaking in, in itself. But what I've we'll done- We'll tell you everything is, in the book in the next five minutes. Exactly. Th this is like the super, super Cliff Notes version of it. But um, you'll see here we've got the, the trifunctional system represented again. I've, I've colorized these so that you can make that distinction uh, from the two lower rungs. But in Plato's Republic, he gives this vision of the perfect state. And the perfect state is an aristocracy uh, that's governed by what he called the philosopher kings. And the philosopher kings... Uh, consisted basically of two types of men, like first function and second function, who were oriented towards the highest good. They had perfect souls. They were perfectly governed by reason. And um, in this society, uh, they were the ones who made all of the decisions. They weren't allowed to own property because uh, that would have they saw that as being a potentially corrupting influence. So only the third function people could own property. But it was these uh, these guardians and um, philosopher kings who, who governed the society and the aristocracy. Now, inevitably, every state degenerates. Uh, Plato saw this, and he showed the sort of cycle of degeneration that the perfect state ultimately would go through. That second rung that you see there, the democracy, this is kind of like Sparta, right? So when you have uh, an aristocracy that descends into this, this second rung, the, the governors of that state are no longer being ruled by we, uh, reason and wisdom, but the will, the will to power, basically. Um, this is a, a military type of state, a state that's um, governed by conquest and war, and uh, the leaders of that state would have been martial men. When it degenerates into the third rung, we have an oligarchy. And um, this is based in worldliness um, and, of course, the appetitive based desires, the love of gold, the love of pleasure, uh, the love of, of gain, of sex, of all of these things. Now, we still have some agency here. We're going to talk about that later, too, when we get into the, how, this, um, how the five regimes are exemplified in the human being. But there's agency at all three of these rungs. 
But once we get below that, the the people no longer have agency. And this this is why I don't have these colorized, because there's an absence of agency to act. The fourth rung here is the democracy. So democracy was seen by Plato as when the state now is being governed by a love of what he called freedom, but what I would call liberality, because it's not true freedom. Uh, with freedom comes responsibility. It's really a love of liberality. And when people are too liberal, they're slaves. So this is a state of slavery. And in the democracy, I mean, democracy means mob rule. A lot of people don't understand the difference between a democracy and a republic. Like here in the United States, we have this two-party system, you know, the Democrats and the Republicans. Democracy is about mob rule. It's literally the appetite of the mob that's governing. That, that is not a, a state you want to live in. No, um, it, is, it is interesting yeah. you mentioned here that it's a state of slavery. Mm -hmm. And we see that there was a time in American history where it was more of an aristocracy. It passed into being a democracy during the World Wars. And then after that, the economy was booming as an oligarchy. And then as that started to decay, we've gotten into this democracy. And the number of laws we've had has exploded. Economic oh, yeah. freedom in a lot of ways is crashing through the floor for many people. At the same time, everything is becoming legislated and uh, legally restricted, and it's harder and harder to do things. And that is really, we're, we're going through that in the American empire, you could say, since uh, you know, America is really made up of multiple um, subcultures so across the country. Uh, yeah, it's the together. new Rome, yeah. And the, re the republic can't survive as a democracy. No. No, we, we have Republic when we have the three rungs mm -hmm. or when any of those three rungs are governing. Obviously, the ideal is the aristocracy, according to Plato. But once we get into these lower rungs, a Republic cannot exist because the people are not sovereign. They have no agency at that point. They're being governed by what I would call subhuman drives. They, they, don't, e they don't even have appetite. They, or I shouldn't say that they don't have appetite, but they're not being governed by appetite so much as they're being governed by this love of liberality, which is a, a giving over of themselves to chaos, really. They're just allowing themselves to be pulled in this direction or that. Again, so many people today, uh, particularly here in the United States where I live, you can see that they're being, being uh, governed by whatever the television tells them to do. Mm -hmm. They don't even think, you know, put on a mask and they just put on the mask obediently. They believe whatever propaganda they're being sold. So, yeah, that, that's really what that state exemplifies is, uh, is a state of slavery. Now, we're just right just on the border. One quick point. One quick sure, point. Sure. In, the, in the top three, they all rule by various sets of rules. The mm -hmm. aristocracy rules by the rules of natural law. Uh, the democracy rules by the rules of, of honor. There is an honor code to the martial power. The yes. oligarchy rules by the rules of business, of negotiation and how you interact with each other. They're usually actually very strict about contracts and these types yeah, of Yeah, contracts. Rules. Yep. And as soon as we go below that, the reason, part of the reason we can't have a republic anymore is because we no longer are functioning based on a system of rules, a system of um, agreed upon rules to the game. We're now on completely feelings, essentially. Uh, people mm -hmm. vote on their feelings. They don't really vote on their thoughts. They don't, there is no system of law to protect minorities, to protect people who are not organized to be uh, catching a majority of the voters. And so we end up with it, it being impossible to run a republic the moment you slip into a true democracy. Right now, we're getting a test in the United States of, is it a democracy or is it a republic? And essentially, we're going to find out is, can you steal an election or not? And if you can right. steal an election and no one does anything about it, now you're even going below the democracy. 
Right. That, and, and that's where we're headed, you know, and that should be of a concern to everyone who's listening to this, who either lives in the United States or lives in a Western country that is going through these tests right now, because the lowest rung is a tyranny. And when the people have fallen into absolute chaos, and, and that's what Plato described the tyranny as being, as being grounded in chaos, they must be controlled externally because they are incapable of controlling themselves internally. So that is really what we're teetering on right now. And the hour is late, but there is still time, I think, for, again, principally men, but, you know, we women too have a role, but it, it is principally the choice and the responsibility of men to decide what are we going to have? Are we going to have a republic? Or are we going to have a democracy and thus a dystopia? Because a democracy is going to lead to a tyranny. There's no other way about it. And uh, our men must make a decision, um, provided a, you know our Supreme Court fails us, and, and it's possible that it might. If, if, even, if, if, even if it succeeds, and even if there is a temporary peace, um, the state that we're in is the result of the state of the people, not the state of the government. The government reflects... Yes. the state of the people. And we will need to go back up that ladder again, one way or another, or we'll be facing this problem every election until eventually we break through to, to tyranny. You mentioned the, the role of women, and women have a lot more power than they realize, and it's not power through the ballot box. Uh, they have power in their ability to, uh, not encourage, um, Inspire. We inspire. talked about this in exactly. a previous video. Yeah. yeah, they they exactly. They have the ability to inspire men to act in their higher interests, to move up towards aristocracy, to move up towards even using their martial power to protect women. Um, and and you know what are men? Men are providers. That's it. You know, fitting in the oligarchy. There, we are protectors in the democracy, and we are leaders. So we, it fits into the aristocracy area, and. To a certain extent, the level at which men behave in that has a lot to do with how inspiring the women that they're surrounded with are. And so this is women's true power and true role in society is to be an inspiration so that men be the very best they can be. And they fill all of those three roles adequately. And we, we are seeing that isn't happening right now. And if you're a woman out there and you feel hopeless, your most powerful thing you can do is to make yourself as good as you can, make yourself as attractive as you can, as sweet as you can, as inspiring and as uh, wonderful as you can so that it inspires masculinity in the men around you and inspires them to become the very best they can be. And this is a, a power that goes way beyond the vote. I'm so glad you said that because, you know, we talk so much in these types of circles about masculine virtue but we don't talk about feminine virtue a lot, you know, and there used to be something called the graces, you know, we, we had, I mean, the Greek myths speak to this, of course, and, and these are the feminine virtues. And um, yeah, I mean, women do have this awesome power to inspire men when they are at their, at their best, when they are beautiful, when they are graceful, when they are feminine, they can be as goddesses to men. And men, men will lay down their lives for a woman who exemplifies the finest in the feminine. And we've gotten so far away from that. And, you know, I don't blame, the, I'm, I'm digressing a little bit from our presentation here, but I mean, you brought this up and I think it's an important point because we need our women to be inspiring our men to do their best right now because we need our men to do their best right now. The hour is late. So, yeah, you know, it's nobody's fault really of the recent generations because we were all born into this extremely feminist influenced uh, culture where girls were pushed into career and to compete and to be more like men than, uh, than women. And a lot of us grew up without fathers. And so we didn't have that strong masculine influence to impress us and, uh, and reflect for us our feminine value. But, uh, you know, now with the red pill, I think any, any of your listeners who are women, you know, you know, you know the, the, the jig is up. I mean, you know what the real the story is. 
and, uh, and that we were all lied to. And it doesn't matter how old you are, you know, you can turn your life around at any time. Um, you can recover a lot of your sexual market value if you just make the right choices, you know, if, if you're overweight, lose the weight. If, uh, if you've got a kind of, you know, rough personality, you can soften the edges. Um, you can learn how to be more feminine. You can rediscover your femininity and, uh, and draw that forth. And I think a lot of guys right now, they just feel uninspired. You know, they, they're not motivated to invest in society because, quite frankly, the women are hideous. And I don't mean to insult anybody, but it, it's the truth. And uh, if the women could just do a little bit of work on themselves, you know, make them 20, 30 percent better than they already are, I think it would go a long way in inspiring the men, you know, to be the best that they can be. Yeah, you brought up an interesting point is the age isn't the, the issue either. Uh, we have, you know, the queen is an old woman and people, when they hear, if, if the queen right today stood up and said, the government is corrupt and blah, 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 and this and that, and the other things happening, um, the country, the men in the country would flock to her. I'm talking the queen of England, of course, they would sure. flock to her. Unfortunately, it's possible they're part of the corruption, but if they were to stand up against it, you know, uh, people, men, men have a natural protective instinct towards women of all ages. You know, we either see them as daughters, as, as uh, se potential sexual partners, as sisters, or as mothers or grandmothers. And so even an older woman can be inspiring to younger men by having grace, by being respectful, by, by having her own gravitas of being a good woman that has a huge impact on people and it is i think very underestimated the true power of femininity and is probably a big part of the reason why feminism has been foisted on the western woman in order to take away her power her true power in her feminine spirit yeah because it ultimately uh sort of neuters the men if the men aren't inspired by the women they won't act. Uh, they they run to video games and porn, and then they become dopamine addicts. And you know, well, that's where we are now, right? Well, and very anxious. Yeah, they, they've done some studies that say that young men in their in their mid late teens who spend some time with their grandmother have their anxiety level drops dramatically. There's really? something I didn't about know that. The, yeah, specifically the grandmother. And for some reason, the maternal grandmother has more of an impact. Um, they've actually said that it's some hormones that women who are postmenopausal that are giving off, and when you're related to them, it's more effective, that calms the, the, uh, late, the, the mid to late teenage man, man's mind and helps to take away his anxiety. Now, it could be something about, you know, if, you're great, if your grandmother's still alive, your civilization is stable. It could be that. Uh, we're not really sure why, but, you know, women have this very important role in society. And, you know, right now, we're, everybody's under quarantine. So you, we're missing out on that connection with our elders. I know growing up that I greatly enjoyed spending time with my great-grandparents. And my great-grandmothers lived much longer than my great-grandfathers. And I enjoyed spending time with them. And uh, hearing about family history, it helped to form my ideas of how society should be formed and of how a family should operate. And a lot of young people are missing out on that today. They don't take the time to be with their relatives who are still alive and learn from them. Yeah, assuming they even have access to them. There's so many broken homes. It's, it, it's a real tragedy. We've, we have been robbed of the wealth of our ancestry. I mean, we really have. And um, I mean, you and I both know this has been done by design. This was intentional. This is an absolute assault on the soul of an entire people. Um, we, we just have to fight to get it back. Yeah, I mean, we're going to have to rebuild it. And that's why we need to understand how society is built, because we can't rebuild anything if we think we're going to start from scratch. We're going to go to pre-Platonic thoughts and we're going to rebuild from the beginning. That doesn't work. Uh, that's the idea of the left. Ignore everything that's worked for 3,000 years and let's start from scratch. And that's not going to work. Yeah. Well, the, the left is very solipsistic. They, they think they're the arbiters of truth and, um, well, they're in for a rude awakening. But uh, let, let's move on. Let's see to how this uh, works with, so we, we have the five regimes of the Republic. Let's mm -hmm. overlay 
the person within that and see how that works out the five regimes in man himself. Yes, yes, because this is where I think this is going to be especially relevant to your listeners because, you know, so many of the folks that you work with are interested in personal development and self-improvement and seeing how this all ties together for the individual is going to be very useful. So, as you can see here in this diagram, I have the five regimes. We see our trifunctional system there at the top. And as I mentioned uh, in, in the last slide, where those three rungs exist, there is some agency. Now, it, it is at its highest where the aristocracy is governing, i.e. The, the logical reasoning part of the soul. And it's at its lowest when the appetitive part of the soul is governing. But there is still some agency there because, as you mentioned, there are rules of, 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 of order, you know, whether it is uh, contracts and, and business rules of business at that lower rung. And we could also include marriage in there, the marriage and family, whether it's the, uh, the rules of war and of honor, of, of conducting oneself honorably in war, or whether it is law, natural law. So... You have those, those three rungs there, and we have our man overlaid to show that. But when we slip below that, we can become a slave or we can be non-functioning, okay? Now, a slave is still functioning. He doesn't have any agency, but he's functional and he produces value for others. He just doesn't produce value for himself. He's being used, right? But somebody who's non-functioning, they, they don't even provide any kind of value. This might be somebody who's so broken that they can't work a job. They can't attract a relationship. They can't even get out of bed in the morning. You know, maybe they're just so, so broken and so depressed that they have fallen into this, this lower state. Now, my concern with what's going on in the world right now is, uh, of course, we have so many people who are functioning at a slave state, and we have many more people who are so depressed or broken, they're not functioning at all. But um, not to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but, you know, there are talks that, you know, there may be something in, uh, I don't, I don't want to say the word, but, um, you know, the, the medical intervention <laughs> that's being proposed to combat the virus that's out there right now may contain some kind of technology that would render us no longer human, that we would basically be these non-functioning drones that could be programmed to do whatever our masters want us to do. So this is a real concern, you know, because the technology certainly exists. And, and we know that there's the will to use it because this has been the goal of mass media for years is to put people into a slave-like position. Mm -hmm. They have the desire to do it. The technology exists. We, we do understand quite a bit about how people are brainwashed, about how um, even the U.S. government has run programs like MKUltra and others to control people's minds, to manipulate them. The Canadian government a few years ago uh, legalized the use of government agencies and resources in the manipulation of the minds of Canadians. They specifically legalized it. So wow. they have a will to use it. They have a desire to use it. They're already doing it in a mnemonic way. They're using mnemonic viruses to control people. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know what they have planned exactly in the future. But if you're up in the aristocracy or the democracy or the oligarchy, it's a lot harder to pull you down into the non-functioning. I have a lot of clients when they come to me, not, not all my clients, of course, I have clients that are what you might call a man of gold and I have clients that are a man of lead. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting reasons why this diagram is so important is we need to know where we are. If you come yes. and you're non-functioning to me, my goal isn't to put you up into being a man of gold instantly. That's, that's a guaranteed failure. That will not work. I want to help you get up to a point where you're functioning, even if, it means a crappy job somewhere and I have to like remind you to do things and we have to start off very, very simply and you need a system where you're essentially a slave. I don't want you to stay there. I want you to keep moving up, you know, get your finances sorted out, get your security sorted out, 
and eventually get you up into becoming a man of gold. But even if you come in as a man of gold, it says high agency, but within that triangle, there is variations. You can, you can be a man of high agency and still develop more agency and get closer to the pinnacle of that because it's almost an infinite point. You can never get up to being perfect agency. So there's always somewhere to move up to. And for most people, the key to them moving up to the next level of success, wherever they happen to be, is the development of more agency. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's an incremental evolution, you know, and, and it's great that that's the method that you take when you're working with your clients, because, you know, a lot of people, if they find themselves in one of these lower rungs and they see other people doing really well, and, you know, the, of course, they're jealous of that and they want to achieve that for themselves, they sometimes reach too high too quickly and then they fail. And that sets up uh, a negative cycle in their brain. Their, their brain learns not to do that again because it resulted in a failure and that becomes counterproductive. What you want to do is you want to set up a series of successes. So you want to make sure you're setting goals that are achievable from where you currently are. So you want to challenge yourself in small little increments so that you're being challenged enough that your brain learns that it can overcome a challenge, but then you have a success at the end of that. So you're getting that dopamine hit and your brain learns, okay, if I do this, I get a reward. So the next time you just raise the bar a little bit higher, you know, again, enough of a challenge that your brain's learning something, but it's an attainable success. You attain that success. You get the dopamine hit. Now you're in a cycle of success. Now you're in a cycle of upward movement. That's the right way to do it. And you'll Absolutely. notice here with, with the five alchemical metals that I have on the side, this is what they were talking about, what the ancients were talking about when they referred to transmuting base metals into gold. And, and I know this because it just makes sense to me that this is what they meant. Transmuting base metals into gold was transmuting the base raw potential of a human being into this divine perfection. Now, you know, we can't obviously attain perfection in our flawed mortal world, but this was the path. This was the pathway to it. Yes, and if you think about it, the most valuable thing that exists is the high agency man. Mm -hmm. A single high agency man can do more to change the course of his civilization uh, than all of the slaves in, in that civilization. And and when we are able to help people reach a higher level, it's exponentially more and more valuable what they're able to give to a society. And it's actually better than being able to transmute lead into gold as far as how much value it brings to the individual and to society. It's the most powerful transformation that a person can make. Yeah, it's something like 20% of, you know, the 80-20 rule, like 20% of you know, the, the people in an organization end up producing 80% of the wealth. Yeah, absolutely. The, the further up you move, the more wealth you generate. And so you become of greater value to yourself and to others the, the farther up you're able to move. Absolutely. And you, you, if you think about it, um, there is actually a shortage of people of high agency, and there always will be a shortage of men of gold. Uh, you can see this in corporations. They, the, the, the big 500 corporations are actually desperate usually to find CEOs to the point that they will pay them a thousand times more than one of their men of iron. You know, their basic employees are, base, are essentially yeah. slaves. They're men of iron. Yeah. They'll pay them a thousand times more and they'll consider it a good deal. They'll yeah. still consider that a good deal because they're so, it's so difficult to find people capable of organizing a company that might have tens of thousands of employees and global operations. And even then you'll see very often when a company that's large fails, it's because of failures at the top. They, they ended up with you know, a man of bronze at the top instead of a man of gold, and they end up failing because of that. So society itself, we're, we're talking very often about how you know, uh, Trump said this years ago in an interview in the 70s that 
Nobody wants to get, nobody good wants to get into politics, he says, because it's such a horrible situation that we simply can't attract good men into politics. They don't want to get involved. They're not interested in that world. And those that are, they see how badly people are treated and they don't want to go up there. We need to create a society. This is not just up to the individuals. We need to create a society that rewards people who want to move up. Now, there's an obvious reward moving from non-functioning to slave or from slave to a man of bronze. Uh, there's some obvious rewards there. But we've created a situation with significantly diminishing returns as you move up. And society tends to actually attack those men of gold, those men who come out and say, look, this is truth, this is reality, and want to disagree with those who are trying to push us back into that slave position. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because we have corruption in the world, unfortunately, and, and that will always be there. You know, that's always going to be an enemy that we have to fight against. But, but that's part of orienting ourselves towards the good. You know, being a lover of honor and wisdom, we have to orient ourselves towards the good, and it's a daily battle we have to fight. And that's what makes us better. You know, if we didn't have that challenge, what would we be? You know, there'd be nothing to overcome. So, yeah, it's always going to be there and, and we just have to deal with it, you know. But, um, yeah, the, the man of gold, he, he brings so much value to his relationships that, yeah, he, he's worth, you know, a hundred, a thousand of, uh, you know, men of iron. And, um, you know, you mentioned that the, the man of iron is like your, your regular employee. I would say, you know, the goal there for, for somebody who's maybe working for a company uh, and they want to move up. The man of bronze owns his own business. I, I see the men of bronze as the property owners. They own businesses. They own land. Um, you know, not not real estate, but they own it in a lodium. You know, um, I've often said that the new landholders are the business owners because it's still like in this day and age, we really can't own land because it's all real estate, but we can own businesses. We can own those outright. So. The men of bronze really are the entrepreneurs, and that would be a goal to set if you are working a regular job and you want to move into the next rung. Take a look at how you can build a business with the skills, knowledge, and interests that you have. I mean, that's an attainable goal, I think, for most people. And you pointed out something interesting that uh, the modern business, really what the modern business is, is information. And mm -hmm. this is why you can control it because it doesn't exist in a, physic in a physical space where it can be stolen from you or where it can be taxed or controlled in the same way that physical property does. Uh, right now, a man who is able to develop a business based on information or a woman that's able to do that based on information and that is portable, that is transportable, that can go anywhere in the world, that person can seek the freest place to operate in the place that allows them to demonstrate the highest level of agency. And it really gives us a lot of power over ourselves. I've had clients that when they came to me, they were uh, working in a terrible minimum wage job. And within a year, they are, I, I got them immediately to start a side gig. Within yeah. a year, their side gig was making so much money, usually less than a year, that they quit their primary job and ended up simp just working in their side gig. That's and the way to do it making more money than they were before working 20 hours a week. Yeah. And, and the thing is, once you become successful in your business and you start to attract uh, the, the respect, the trust, the followership of others, now you're in a position to move into the next rung, right? Th this is how in the old Anglo-Saxon uh, society, a, a man became a lord with retainers, right? He would have thanes who would pledge their fealty to him because he was a man who had property and he was a man who had influence. Now he has the loyalty of other men and, and this is how you build, right? So then you move into that position. You, you become effectively a lord over other men who are going to pledge their loyalty to you. They're going to they're gonna stand by you and help you protect your property. I, I asked my son that. I said to him, what do you think it takes to lead men that are willing to fight for you? And he's seven years old. And he thought about mm -hmm. it. He said, you have to protect them. 
That's right. So that they will protect you. And that's why it's, that's why it come, becomes the, the martial uh, valor is, is the next step of that in there with the man of silver. And, and he intuited that the, it is the man of silver that both protects and is protected by his men. He's the one that organizes them and makes them much safer and stronger than they would be as, as a bunch of disorganized men. And as we move up, it's harder and harder to find these kind of men. You know, you might think of them in uh, medieval times as the, the dukes, the lords of manners, and as you mentioned, and mm -hmm. those are, were an important part of organizing society when we didn't have communications and lots of roads so that you, know, you couldn't, couldn't phone people up and tell them what to do. The news couldn't tell you what to do. And so you had to work as small independent groups working together with lots of men of silver. And during that time of European history, there was a lot of promotion of higher agency thinking because we needed it just to hold the territory we had just to survive. Um, right. You know, now we, we promote low agency thinking because high agency is in the way of the elites. And so they right. promote low agency thinking. There was a time when high agency thinking was actually essential just for the survival of civilization. And we will go back to there. The situation we're in is not sustainable. Right. And, the, and then if you become a, uh, a respected, trusted, and influential man among other trusted, respected, influential men, when, when they start to look to you, that then you get elevated to that highest rung. You know, that's sort of the rung of kingship. And in the elder days, this is how our Germanic, Germanic ancestors elected their kings. You know, some people might not realize our kings were elected. They used to raise them up on a shield. Um, they were born out of the, the chieftains. The chieftains would choose from among their, their best a man who would be the king, and he was elected, and he would serve for a term. This is before the divine right of kings corrupted everything. That came over with the Roman church. That was something alien to our people. But um, we had a true meritocracy in the pre-Christian times of our Anglo-Germanic ancestors. And what, when you have a true meritocracy, you must have a reciprocal relationship with everyone in that chain who is, has agency. So everyone from the man of bronze up must have a reciprocal relationship with each other because each group is either supporting or protecting the other group. And mm -hmm. this creates a much higher level of peace. It prevents uh, tyranny from forming. And we, we did, of course, we, we had a slave class as well, a thrall class. Um, they did not have a reciprocal relationship with the rest. But those who, were, who had agency whose opinion actually mattered because they were capable of forming an opinion uh, that, was, that was sensible and logical and reasonable, they had to be given a place at the table. And so we had a lot more respect for each other. The, the men of bronze, they paid their taxes through uh, physical production. Uh, the men of silver, they paid their taxes through martial protection of the people. And the men of gold, they paid their taxes. Even the king paid his taxes, but he paid it in serving as a king. There right. was a time when the concept of the king as a servant existed. He served the people. And exactly. when they didn't, uh, you know, Europe has a history of removing kings and leaders that don't serve the people. Yeah, sometimes in very violent ways and sometimes yeah. by members of their own family. You know, yes. if, if, if the king was, uh, was working against the interests of his own family and, and plundering the wealth of the family, they might remove him, you know. So, yeah. It's better, it's better to remove the king from your family than to have your whole family removed by the men of silver who say your entire <laughs> aristocracy needs to go because you're all corrupt and you're not doing anything about it. And that is an interesting point is that within our area, we're responsible for policing each other. The, you know, the men of bronze, the, the businessmen, they would police each other. If there was people breaking rules, breaking laws, they would bring it to court and have these yeah. things settled. The men of Freaking honor, contracts, they through, yeah. yeah, through contracts. The men of honor, they would do this through duels, and uh, even even at the level of the aristocracy, they had their own ways of, of dealing internally with each other, and and weeding out those who were bad. And it's not a perfect system, but it is a system under which Western civilization was created, and it was an incredibly powerful and incredibly um, competitive system, and 
we ended up taking over the entire world during the time when we had this aristocracy, when, you know, the, the time of great expansion, expansion in the West, all the Western countries were kingdoms. Mm -hmm. That's right. We had a lot more sovereignty back then yes. uh, than we have today, if we have any sovereignty left at all, I, I wonder. <laughs> but, um, you know, you're, the, the work that you do, uh, Noah, it, it very much, um, you know, reflects what, what this model is here and, you know, helping people, uh, regardless of where they find themselves uh, on the pyramid, uh, helping them to move upward. And um, I think it's great work. I'm, I'm glad to be able to be a part of it and, and help you out however I can. Um, so uh, we should just tell people how we can, how they can yeah. get in touch with us, you know, if they need coaching or consultation. Um, I know you said some people might be interested in getting in touch with me and uh, we'll, we'll find a way, we'll make a way possible for them to do that if, if they want to talk with me. And, yes, and uh, I think to, you, you have an excellent perspective on what the fatherless uh, individuals can do and what people who were abandoned and lied to by society and ended up not being able to create the typical white picket fence lifestyle, how you can still have a, a future and how you can still have something valuable there. And you have a wonderful insight into the psychology and mind of these people. And so if anyone wants to get in, in touch with Haythrun, um, message me. All of the contacts will be put in the, uh, the notes below this video. Thank, thank you. I appreciate that. And um, if I can help anybody out that I can, I'm, I'm happy to do so. And uh, thank you also for those compliments. I, you know, I, I got a lot of my insights from my own journey and my own experience. Uh, I, I think uh, all of us who were born, you know, in the last couple generations have We've had a struggle, and uh, we've gained a lot by by making that journey. So, whatever I can do to help other people come along, I'm happy to do it. Absolutely, and please subscribe to this channel. We're going to be doing another couple of parts to this series. Uh, have a look at the original part that we did. I will put a link to that as well, and take the time to listen to it, to think about it and comment on it and ask us any questions. If we get some good questions, we'll try to answer them in the comments below. And if they're excellent questions, we may even be able to include them in the next, uh, in the next section, trying to answer any of those questions or address concerns people have. Thank you very much for listening to this video. And thank you very much, Aethrin, for joining us. This has been Of Mind and Men, The Evolution of Mindedness in the West, Part 2 talking about the tripartite theory of the soul. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Noah. Good evening.